Hello, and welcome to The Circular Economy Show. I'm Jess. And I'm Finn. And in this episode of The Circular Economy Show, we'll be diving deeper into the world of plastics. Later on, we'll hear from Marta, who attended the recent INC3 conference in Nairobi, where latest negotiations on a global plastics treaty were taking place. We'll also be talking about what's needed to kickstart a reuse revolution and why this is so important. Shortly, we'll hear from the Foundation's Plastics Initiative lead, Sander. We'll find out what progress has been made and what is left to do to end plastic pollution. But first, to set that conversation up, Let's watch this short video created to mark five years of the new plastics economy global commitment. Did you know we overestimate what we can do in the short run, but underestimate what in five years time can be done? It took five years to map the human genome. Five years for Michelangelo to paint this chapel in Rome. Five years to take a giant leap on lunar lands. Five years in, the global commitment has shown progress is in our hands. To make plastic waste a thing of the past, over 1,000 organisations across the world joined steadfast, eliminating the use of plastics we don't need. Together, leaders pulled off this feat, doubling their share of recycled content too. That's a barrel of oil left in the ground every count to two. Will we meet all our goals? No. There are many challenges and still a long way to go. We've identified the hurdles and clearly see the next steps towards a circular economy. We need legally binding measures by policymakers and accelerated business action by movers and shakers. The next five years are crucial to scale the solutions. So let's all choose the path that stops plastic pollution. So progress is in our hands, but how do we get there and what do we need to make the kind of progress that will end plastic pollution? On the 31st of October, the Foundation and the United Nations Environment Programme released the latest Global Commitment Report. The Foundation's Gabriella caught up with Sander, the Plastics Initiative Lead, to find out where we are now and what's needed to move forward. Sandra, welcome to the show. We've just watched the Five Years In video. Thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. I'd just love to ask you a few questions. First of all, for those people who may not be familiar with the Global Commitment, can you just give a brief overview of its beginnings and why we started the Global Commitment? Yeah, the Global Commitment was conceived back in 2017, 2018, when the world at large had only just woken up to the problem of plastic waste and pollution, really shocked by the prospect of a future in which there could be more plastics in our oceans than fish. At that time, there was absolutely no consensus view on, on how to actually tackle that issue. Um, the industry, as well as government action at the time, was still very limited and fragmented, and, and therefore, it was our aim as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, together with um, UN Environment Programme, to really bring together a pioneering group of stakeholders and have them collectively step forward, um, agree to work towards one common vision and a set of 2025 targets um, at a scale that, that had never been done before. Thank you. And now, five years in since that launch in 2018, how far have we come on these objectives? We made very strong progress on, on all of them. Um, when we look at Mobilize, we now have more than a thousand organizations aligned behind one common vision of a circular economy. Um, we, that includes businesses representing 20% of all plastic packaging globally, includes 55 governments representing more than a billion people around the world, represents NGOs, academics, investors, etc. 
Um, all of those business signatories and government signatories are working towards a common set of 2025 targets. They've mobilized dedicated teams, dedicated efforts towards that. They've mobilized more than $10 billion of dollars of investments towards achieving those targets. Um, so it had a really big mobilization effect. When it comes to deliver, um, here the picture is, is nuanced. Like on the one hand, um, Unfortunately, it's it's clear that we won't meet or the signatories won't meet all the 2025 targets. Um, at the same time, we do see, and that's what we lay out in our report, that, that the business signatories have actually significantly outperformed the rest of the market and they have delivered um, real initial progress at scale. Just to share a few examples, they've reduced their use of several of the most problematic uh, plastic packaging items that while the world as a whole is still increasing its use of those items. They've more than doubled their share of recycled content, uh, which results in an increase of 1.5 million tons of recycled plastics. Um, that's equivalent of keeping one barrel of oil in the ground every two seconds. And then they stabilized their use of virgin plastic use. Uh, some signatories, leading signatories even decreased it significantly. And that again in a time frame where the market as a whole has increased the use of recycle, of, uh, sorry, virgin plastic use by more than 11%. Um, so while not delivering as much progress as we had collectively aimed for when we set those targets back in 2018, um, the signatories have shown that meaningful progress at scale uh, is possible uh, by significantly outperforming the rest of the market. The third objective was, was to learn. Um, and also here, I think we've come a very long way. When we started back in 2018, most of the businesses and the signatories we work with uh, did not have a, an idea of how many plastic packaging they were putting on the market, let alone how much was recyclable, how much recycled content was used, how much was reusable. Um, now we are in a situation where all these signatories are annually reporting progress, all using the same metrics and definitions and all of that being publicly available on our website. So that transparency is, is truly unprecedented. Uh, and that's been important to um, learn about where are we actually making progress as well as uh, where are the pivotal hurdles, where is progress lacking to inform um, the next steps and, and improve decision making, both for those businesses themselves, as well as for policymakers, investors, and many others. And then our last objective was, was to catalyze. And, and here, I, I think it's fair to say the impact of the global commitment went far beyond the signatory group itself uh, by creating that common vision, common like target framework, uh, common definitions, common language that has been picked up by many, many others, uh, many other voluntary initiative. It has informed policy. It has formed the basis for um, other initiatives, including 11 plastic pacts around the world. So we've seen investors pick that up and, and investor engagement guides being developed based on the global commitment framework. Uh, and, and that list um, goes on for, for another while. Um, so the learnings from uh, from the global commitment uh, really also offer uh, valuable insights to the negotiators that are currently discussing an international global treaty. So we do hope that the, this report and, and sharing those learnings of five years of global commitment will, will really inform the treaty negotiations as well. Yet still five years in, the world is off track to stop plastic pollution. Why do you think this is? First of all, 80% of the plastic packaging industry is not in the global commitment. And as we've seen, um, they are on average performing way worse than the signatory group. And secondly, even that leading group of signatories uh, is expecting to miss 2025 targets and is struggling with a few pivotal hurdles that are preventing further progress. So these pivotal hurdles include scaling reuse, um, tackling the issue of, of flexible plastic packaging, uh, as well as a lack of infrastructure to collect, reuse and recycle packaging after use. So we kind of want to see two things based on the learnings to date. Um, one is in the areas where global commitment signatories have proven that strong progress at scale really is possible, such as eliminating problematic items, uh, reducing virgin plastic use, inc increasing the use of recycled plastics in those areas, we call on um, all businesses to, to replicate the best practices and, and follow the lead of, um, of this group. And we call on policymakers to also mandate this progress uh, that is proven possible, uh, mandate that across the entire market and as such really create a, a level playing field. 
And then secondly, in the areas where even the leading companies have made very limited progress and are struggling with some pivotal hurdles, there we call for both bold policy interventions as well as further accelerated business innovation to overcome these pivotal hurdles um, as they will be crucial to, uh, to solving this problem. Something that I just picked up on there, you mentioned policy and business action. What role do you see that both of these could play um, going forward to make sure that we can end plastic pollution? The fastest way to drive progress is, is through a kind of an, a reinforcing ambition loop where both po uh, policy action as well as business action mutually reinforce and build off each other. Um, and just to illustrate that it's kind of where leading businesses continue to, to demonstrate what's possible, uh, as well as be vocally supportive of, of ambitious uh, new policies, um, as a signal to government that the industry is ready to um, move to a higher playing field, which then enables or gives confidence to policymakers to put in place new policies, make sure the entire market um, ups its game, so not just those that step forward voluntarily, as well as in turn then enable those industry uh, leaders to further raise their bar and, and take the next steps. And, and this loop um, kind of iterates over and over to, to really create a, a race to the top. And a very important part of this ambition loop, of driving this ambition loop, uh, will be the currently negotiated Global Plastics Treaty. Um, that's really a, a once in a generation opportunity to accelerate global change on, on this topic. By putting in place legally binding global rules, um, such, a, uh, such a, a treaty can really ensure that all countries, uh, all actors in, in business uh, act in a concerted way to unlock the solutions that, that we need to see. Thank you. And then finally, uh, 2025 isn't that far away. What does that mean for the global commitment beyond that date? And if we were both to have this conversation in another five years time, where do you think we might be? So I would say if, if we are sitting here again in, in five years time, um, in, in you know, somewhere 20, 2028, um, I would hope that we, we by then have an ambitious global treaty in place with, some, with a set of strong um, global legally binding measures as, as part of that, and that we start to see those being implemented all around the world, uh, complemented by hopefully a, a leading group of stakeholders united under the global commitment that decided to continue to step up being a front runner and uh, continue to outperform the rest of the market, pushing progress uh, further and faster. So hopefully in five years time, we are able to, to talk about these things. Thank you, Sander, for all of that information. It's clear in five years that there has been so much progress and a lot of learnings that we can really take forwards into the next five years. And that's a lot of hope and outlook for the future. Um, I know it's been a really busy time preparing this paper. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So a lot has been achieved, but there's even more that's left to do. Sana told us that one of the critical areas where more progress is needed is in scaling reuse. The Foundation has recently published a study focused on the potential benefits of scaling reuse, in particular, returnable packaging systems. So first, let's watch a short video to explain the study, and then we're going to hear from Diliana, who's going to tell us even more. How to kickstart a reuse revolution. One, recognize the huge potential of reuse, in particular returnable packaging, to tackle plastic pollution. Two, collaborate, because no single organization can kickstart the reuse revolution alone. Businesses, policymakers, financial institutions, and civil society will need to work together. Three, invest in shared reuse infrastructure and collaborate to harmonize packaging design and standards. Done right, the economics of reuse can compete with single-use packaging. Four, demonstrate what is possible through large-scale projects. We need examples that involve collaboration across multiple sectors beyond individual pilots. Five, regulate, because while important, voluntary action alone is not enough. Policy measures complemented by voluntary action are crucial to ensure progress is pushed further and faster. Current talks on designing a legally binding global treaty to end plastic pollution represent a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to accelerate the scale-up of reuse. 
By following these steps, we can make the economics of reuse work and unlock immense environmental benefits. It's time for a reuse revolution. Imagine you're a bee and you have a vision for a large honeycomb filled with precious honey. It's nature's, one of nature's most amazing creations. So you make a start on your own. You start building little hexagon walls. You find big flowers with nectar. You start making trips one by one, all on your own. And you see other bees in the distance doing the same thing, doing everything on their own, improving their honeycomb building skills, flying faster, working harder. And you're getting tired and you're getting frustrated because you see that this honeycomb is not emerging. So you start to wonder, is it even possible to create a large honeycomb all on your own? What if there was a better way? So this is what we're seeing in efforts to scale reusable packaging. Many organizations, many global brands and retailers are launching individual pilots all on their own. And despite all of this momentum, despite all of these individual pilots, we're seeing that the share of reusable packaging has remained flat at one to 2%. So it's really clear that no single organization can scale reuse on its own. We really need a fundamentally new approach to doing this. And this is what, really what we mean when we say we need a reuse revolution. So alongside other recent studies, our report has demonstrated that scaling reuse and in particular returnable packaging is one of the biggest opportunities to tackle the plastic waste and pollution crisis. Without scaling reuse as quickly as possible, worldwide virgin plastic use in packaging is unlikely to reduce below today's levels before 2050, so the stakes are really high. So this is exactly the big question that we set out to address with our new study, Unlocking a Reuse Revolution by Scaling Returnable Packaging. The really big research question was how might we design a scaled returnable packaging system of the future that can compete with single use both environmentally and economically. So we came together um, with a big group of over 60 leading organizations in the space. For example, the European Investment Bank, national government, also reuse experts across civil society, and some of the biggest brands and retailers in the packaging industry, like Danone, like Pepsi, like Unilever. We've also partnered with Systemic and Unomia to envision what scenarios of the future could look like to really bring to life scaled return systems to also model the economic and environmental performance of these systems to build the evidence base, and to also catalyze action by creating a shared understanding of the key drivers and benefits of these systems. Well, of course, we don't have all the answers, and this level of transformation won't be easy, it won't happen overnight. At the same time, I believe that our new study, Unlocking a Reuse Revolution, is providing really valuable insights that are exciting and empowering starting points. So our study shows that scaling returnable packaging can have huge potential environmental benefits across greenhouse gas emission savings, reducing water use, and also reducing the reliance on raw materials. And if done right, the economics of scaling reuse can also compete with single use for some products. Our modeling analysis has generated key insights on the most important drivers that can achieve these benefits. Sharing the infrastructure, the infrastructure used for cleaning, transport, logistics, and also standardizing the packaging to be able to effectively use that shared infrastructure in practice are really crucial to unlock the economies of scale that we need in order to make the economics work for scaled reuse systems. To kickstart a reuse revolution, we need a fundamentally new approach to scaling reuse and returnable packaging systems. One that is truly collaborative, involving businesses across the whole supply chain, policymakers at all levels of government, financial institutions, and of course, civil society and citizens, all coming together, leveraging the insights on benefits and drivers that this new research is offering. So to sum it all up, remember the honeycomb, one of the most amazing and useful infrastructures created in nature. It's all about sharing the infrastructure, creating standardized packaging, and working together 
It won't be easy, it won't happen overnight. Collaboration is crucial, and if we do these things together, we can unlock the reuse revolution. So yes, remember the honeycomb. Diliana doubled down there on the importance of shared infrastructure and standardization as critical to scaling a reuse revolution. And this is exactly why, alongside voluntary commitments, we need a legally binding global plastics treaty to level out the playing field. So what can we hope for from a global plastics treaty? Well, the Foundation, together with WWF, have brought together the Business Coalition to advocate for a treaty with impact. Let's find out more in this next video. We are committed to supporting the development of an ambitious, effective and legally binding UN treaty to end plastic pollution. As businesses operating globally, we need global rules and measures so that we can play our part in driving change at a global scale. We know aspirations to end plastic pollution has no value on their own. Aspirations must become action. Through binding provisions in the treaty, we believe governments must establish harmonized regulations. These regulations should focus on the reduction and circulation of plastics, alongside the prevention and remediation of their leakage into our environment. The Zero Draft is a good basis for UN member states to start discussions. And negotiators can now strengthen and align on those core obligations that must be implemented by national governments. A, a coalition bringing over 150 companies and financial institutions can and will make a decisive impact and can and will make a visible change to what is a critical issue. We share an ambition to work towards a circular economy in which plastic never becomes pollution and the value of products and materials is retained in the economy. Voluntary corporate action alone isn't enough. We are asking for stronger rules and harmonized regulations. A legally binding treaty is vital to creating a level playing field for entire industries, avoiding a patchwork of disconnected national efforts. The next gathering of the International Negotiations Committee in Nairobi represents a rare and real opportunity to make a positive change to our world by reassessing how we make, use, and think about plastic. So what does that all really mean? And what kind of progress are we seeing? Seb recently caught up with Marta, who has just come back from Nairobi from the latest round of discussions of INC3. So Marta, thank you for joining us. I understand that you've recently been at the recent negotiations for the Global Plastics Treaty in Nairobi, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I thought I'd just ask you, could you remind us why are these negotiations so important? Hi, Seb. Um, yes, um, this is a once in a generation opportunity to transform the global plastics value chain. Um, and to create a world where plastic uh, doesn't pollute land and oceans. Um, you are aware that um, we run voluntary action programs like the Global Commitment, which is the biggest voluntary action and packaging. And we've just taken stock of the five years um, of, of the program. And some of the key takeaways are really emphasizing the need for the Global Plastics Treaty and for the negotiations, um, in that we know that progress is possible, but also that voluntary action alone is not enough. Um, and to end plastic pollution, we need uh, we need the treaty to set uh, global rules instead of a patchwork of national legislations that are so um, hardwired into linear economy. Yeah, so that... Um kind of reflection on five years of the global commitment had those kind of headlines of progress has been made there's more for the global commitment group to do but also that they are outperforming the market and in order to level the wider playing field we need this kind of legally binding uh, policy as you articulate 
So along with WWF, the foundation has convened the Business Coalition for a Global Plastics Treaty, you know, comprising of more than 180 organisations, many of them the largest plastic packaging producers in the world. For some watching this, they might be saying, well, why are some of the largest plastic packaging businesses or packaging businesses advocating for regulation against themselves? Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Seb. I mean, in real world, businesses respond to regulatory certainty um, and they need harmonised rules to create a level playing field um, that can unlock investment and innovation. So this is why they're uh, calling for an ambitious and effective plastics treaty that is based on uh, globally binding rules Um, And actually, the Business Coalition um, developed a very comprehensive set of policy recommendations for the treaty, which uh, can be found on their website. But these policy recommendations are focused around three core areas, around reduction um, um, to reduce the production and use of plastics, around circulation to circulate the plastics that we need, And uh, finally, around remediation and mitigation of the plastics that are um, hard to abate uh, and and that leak into the environment. On the Circle Economy show, we've covered um, the progress of the Global Plastics Treaty um, for a while. Can you just tell us what kind of stage are we at now in these negotiations? So the stage where we are now is that since uh, November last year, we've had three rounds of negotiations. The first one was in Uruguay in November, then we had one in Paris in May, and now we've just come out of the third round of negotiations in Nairobi, and there are two uh, negotiating rounds left to go. And and what's the significance of what progress, you know, what happened in Nairobi? You were there, I can imagine it's quite a hectic few days or week, how long you were there for, but what, what, what progress have we made so far? So this was the first moment where the um, national delegations had the legal text in front of them uh, for the treaty. It was called the Zero Draft Text, um, and it was uh, developed by the chair and the secretariat based on the submissions in the written format by the member states, uh, and also based on the positions expressed uh, in the previous negotiating rounds. Um, And that text um, covered the core provisions of the treaty um, and had one to three options per each provision. Um, And what happened in Nairobi is um, it was quite interesting. There there were um, voices by some member states um, to say that they didn't feel their um, positions were fully captured in the zero draft. So as a consequence, the committee agreed to actually open the zero draft for further input from the member states. Um, And um, as a result, we... uh, all the member states had the opportunity to contribute, provide additional options to the text, but also provide um, alternative wording. What we have is that um, we now have a very comprehensive compilation of views from all the member states, um, which is the upside in that um, this is really truly the global governance at play, where every member state has the opportunity to share their perspective. Um, I guess the challenge with that is that now the text of the treaty is very uh, is 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 much ex- is expanded. And in some instances, there are multiple yeah, alternative wordings of, for example, 11 options per provision. And what makes it a challenge is that it's difficult to negotiate on, on this kind of text. So it's important that now um, in Canada, the next round of negotiations, the text gets streamlined further um, to reduce the number of options or to merge the options so that the national delegations can start line by line um, negotiations. Obviously, Marta, I'm an expert on policy. So all the language you're saying, I'm completely understanding. But just in case there's someone watching, like, 
what's an example of like a provision? Like what, what kind of thing are you talking about? And maybe it's not easy to share precisely in this case, but what kind of things is a provision? Yeah, so for example, uh, a, a provision is really what constitutes the obligation on a member state and the measure on a member state. So, for example, um, what is uh, what the treaty talks about is um, uh, 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 measures on uh, elimination of um, unnecessary and avoidable plastics and how should the member states uh, tackle this. And so they're, they're basically the, the big headline things that c- member states are going to be committed to legally by the, by, by the signing of the treaty. Exactly, spot on, yeah. And, and you wanted to go on to describe a bit of some of the substance that came out of Nairobi? Um, it was very encouraging to see that there was support for the, for example, pr- provisions on elimination of avoidable and problematic plastic products. Uh, on measures around product design uh, on the EPR uh, and also on um, on the primary uh, production of the primary um, uh, polymers, which is going into the upstream. Um, on the other hand, however, um, there were calls for some member states to narrow down the scope of the treaty and focus the treaty only on the waste management um, and only on downstream measures, um, even to the point that some member states were calling to remove those um, upstream um, me- measures from the scope of the treaty. Um, so that was quite concerning because we know that that to be effective, the treaty needs to be based on the comprehensive circular economy measures, um, and it can't just focus on on downstream on only. Yeah, we can't tackle this problem at the end of the pipe. We need to tackle it upstream in design by eliminating unnecessary packaging, packaging designing things to be circulated, um, as you've already said, um, Marta. So I guess with that in mind, um, with those kind of debates ongoing, what what's critical to happen next? What's critical to happen, I guess, between the next convening and at the next convening? Our um, call is for two things. Um, One is for the member states not to give up on the ambition uh, and continue um, continue working to deliver this treaty that's based on globally binding rules that are based on comprehensive measures so that we can eliminate the plastics that we don't need, um, so that we can innovate new business models, new materials, and so that we can circulate um the the plastics that we still need to use so that would be the first area um the second area is um about still making progress um between now and canada uh, and looking for ways of how the member states can informally advance the work to get um inputs that will be useful for that next negotiating round um, and to, I guess, maybe bring it into uh, into a concrete examples is to look at um, what information is out there that already exists. Are there starting points that exist that could then inform development of some of the provisions? So we spoke earlier about the uh, avoidable and unnecessary plastic products. For example, um, in the global commitment, there is already an alignment on how to, what criteria to use to identify those. So we would um, urge member states to to do that piece of work, to look out there, to to gather the information, to keep the momentum going, um, so that they come in prepared and are ready to um, to use the information at hand to. To, to basically negotiate, to, to narrow down the text then in uh, Canada and start getting into these detailed line-by-line negotiations. Um, because, I mean, there isn't time to waste. Um, there isn't time to waste in that official timeline, but even if you were to disregard the official timeline and, and really take a step back and think about why it's so important, why we're doing it, um, every day, the plastic pollution crisis deepens. So it's it's important that uh, that the member states uh, 
really develop and agree this uh, legal instrument to be able to, to end plastic pollution. So it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. We are seeing the right kind of ambition level in terms of upstream um, support for upstream measures from many member states, um, but we need to press on and we need to narrow that zero draft text down um, in time to implement the legally binding measures that the Global Plastic Treaty promises. Thank you so much, Marta, for your insights from Nairobi. It's really clear that this treaty is a once-in-a-generation opportunity, which has gained a lot of momentum, but there's still a lot left to do. And this is the last episode of the Circular Economy Show. So thanks to you, our viewers, for all your comments, questions and attention. But rest assured, there's even more content to come in 2024, so keep following us. And make sure you subscribe to the Circular Economy Show podcast, which will be filled with more insights and stories like these in 2024. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope that you get to enjoy a wonderful winter break. See you next year.